Welcome to all. This is our uh, second webinar of the HRM chapter of the Schizophrenia Society of Nova Scotia. My name is Wendy Rogers. I'm on the board and I'm treasurer of the uh, society of the HRM chapter. Uh, this evening our topic is going to be a review of the Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act. And um, it was actually established and introduced in December 2005, and a review was completed in December 2013. Um, participants here are welcome to ask questions during the presentation. Online questions will be addressed uh, the last five to 10 minutes of the webcast. Uh, I want to thank Todd McMillan. You can't see him, but he is there. He's uh, our high-tech guy, and uh, he's going to be uh, helping us out with the webinar today. Okay. Uh, for any of you who don't know, our uh, speaker today is Dr. Stephen Ayer. He's uh, been a lifesaver for our family and many, many families. Uh, he's the, the executive director of the Schizophrenia Society. And um, he's always there when we need him. Dr. Stephen Ayer has been the executive director of the Schizophrenia Society of Nova Scotia since 2006. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Alberta and a PhD in Chemistry from the University of British Columbia. Dr. Ayer was awarded postgraduate and postdoctoral fellowships by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, and he received a prestigious Killam Postdoctoral Research Fellowship from the University of British Columbia. He has co-authored over 30 peer-reviewed scientific papers. Dr. Ayer previously held the position of interim coordinator with the Healthy Minds Cooperative and organizations which he helped establish in 2005. On appointment, on appointment by the Nova Scotia Ministry of Health, he served on the Nova Scotia Psychiatric Facilities Review Board from 2005 to 2007. He was also a member of the panel of mental health and medical experts appointed by the Nova Scotia Ministers of Justice and Health to review the phenomenon known as excited delirium and to develop a protocol for an appropriate response by law enforcement officers. The panel's findings and recommendations were made public in September 2009. He is currently the Schizophrenia Society of Nova Scotia's representative on the Provincial Mental Health and Justice Liaison Committees. In 2009, Dr. Ayer was honored by the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia and the Canadian Mental Health Association, Nova Scotia Division, with an Inspiring Lives Award. He is the recipient of the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, and he received the 2013 Outstanding Staff Award from the Schizophrenia Society of Nova Scotia. So as you can see, he's a bit of a superstar. <laughs> and we are very, very fortunate and blessed to have him as a member of our team. And I know that he is received very lofty accolades, but I, I must say from our experience with uh, Stephen Ayer, he's always a lifeline for people in situations uh, dealing with mental illness and um, the caregivers. So I'm just so thrilled that he's here with us today to review this important piece of legislation. Just a couple of housekeeping things. I'm going to send around the attendance sheet and uh, put your email on it only if you are a new member or a new, new attending the meeting. Um, and we're also going to have evaluate, evaluations to be sent around, and it's very important that we get these because we keep wanting to continue to improve and um, make the meetings relevant. Just one more little thing. Um, we have revised and uh, now have our new brochures that we're going to be putting in medical clinics and so on. So without further ado, 
Am I okay to, to let you take it over yeah. now? Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Is there enough time? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Wendy. I appreciate the introduction. Um, very kind of you. Kind words. Uh, welcome, everybody, and uh, everybody who's watching online. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about the Involuntary Psychiatric Treatment Act, and I'll refer to it in shorthand as IPTA. I -P -T -A, IPTA. Um, and specifically, I want to talk about a review that was done uh, by a couple of people, and I'll get to that. In, in in just a second. But before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about what IPTA is. And uh, I'm program my uh, iPad to stay on, but we'll see if, it, if I just keep, touch, keep touching it. So IPTA is, is a law, it's a civil law in Nova Scotia, which has been around since uh, July of 2007. And it allows for basically the involuntary uh, hospitalization of people who meet certain criteria. And one of the things that it allows for is that uh, a medical examination of a person can, can be completed by two physicians generally. And those two physicians can then fill out the appropriate forms, which would then have a person taken or uh, involuntarily taken to a psychiatric facility for a psychiatric assessment. It also allows a peace officer to take a person into custody for the purpose of a medical examination by, by physicians. And also anyone can apply to a court, uh, it's, it's family court in Nova Scotia, for a hearing before a judge to have a person uh, taken by a peace officer or any other authorized individual for a medical examination by a physician. And it also allows for involuntary hospitalization when, as I mentioned, certain criteria are met. And the act also covers voluntary hospitalization. Many people aren't aware of that, and that's going to become very important today as I talk about the act and the review of the act that was just recently completed. The act, uh, the IPTA also uh, allows for certi certificates of leave and community treatment orders. So, the, if, so IPTA was, was reviewed by two individuals, um, Justice Lafore, who's on your left in that uh, slide, and Professor Leahy, who's a, who's a professor at Dalhousie University uh, Faculty of Law. And they started their review of IPTA in, uh, where they, they were appointed in October 2012 and didn't really start the review until January of 2013. And many of us in this room were actually part of that review or participated in that review in some way or another, either by um, writing online in, in terms of uh, answering uh, the questions that they, had, they were posing on their online questionnaire or taking part in some of the uh, uh, meetings that they held throughout, throughout the province. And they completed a report, which is this report right here, in July of 2013. So you can imagine the amount of work that they did in, in basically six months. It's, it's quite amazing. And they did have quite a bit of help. And uh, Leah Hutt was one uh, person who, who provided a lot of, a lot of uh, help to them. And, uh, and there were many others. And this report contains 101 recommendations. And it was made public on December 12th 2013. And that me made public means it, would it was tabled in the legislature by the Minister of Health, Leo, and I'll have to check my notes on how to say his name. It's uh, Devine. Leo Devine uh, tabled this in the legislature in, in December of 2013. And the total amount of pages is 446. So you can imagine. Uh, that 
we're not going to sit here today. <laughs> and I, I'm not going to go through all 101 recommendations. I, I, I'm going to select a, a few of the recommendations based on something that I really want to talk about today. And, I'll, and I'll, I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But before I do that, I want to talk about what uh, the Minister of Health and Wellness said when he tabled th this report. And uh, basically, he said that uh, in the news release that the, the province considers the recommendations to improve the effectiveness, that they will consider the recommendations to improve the effectiveness and strength of the involuntary psychiatric treatment act as outlined in this report. And that uh, he supports the direction of the review and its recommendations. And uh, he is committed to meeting with interested parties to examine the recommendations in more detail. And so, and then he goes on to say, overall, we're hearing that the uh, that IFTA is working, and that it, it, its objectives are supported by those who participated in the review. And that's an important statement, actually, because um, conceivably it could have turned out quite differently. And I won't go into details of what that might have been, but. Um, there are uh, different, differing opinions as to whether or not involuntary psychiatric treatment is, is a way to go. And uh, basically this review stated that they didn't want to go back and revisit some of those past uh, debates, but they were fully satisfied that if there was a, as a, as a law in Nova Scotia was something that, that, that they as the reviewers would fully support. So this allows me to go into now some of the details of the recommendations in this report. And before I do that, I want to say something about while I was preparing this presentation, I'm normally quite animated and uh, actually moving around and uh, have a lot of different things to, to say without having to look at information in front of me. Um, and so I wanted to put this slide up to sort of say, <laughs> say that um, maybe this is the only slide where um, you're going to be fully engaged. What's going on? <laughs> uh, this is a photograph that I got off, uh, off the internet and the credits given at the bottom. I thought it's very appropriate. This dog is very excited about what's going on. And hopefully, you'll be engaged and excited about what I'm going to say tonight. Um, so I want to I want to start off by saying that when IFTA first uh, came out or first was proposed, a lot of people were saying, you know, it's not going to apply to a lot of people. It really won't apply to a lot of people. And I thought, well, you're probably right. It probably probably won't. Probably there's not that many people that that would be um, you know involuntarily hospitalized or taken for a medical examination uh, against their will. Uh, however, the, this report states that in any given year, there are between 2,400 and 2,800 people receiving mental health care on an inpatient base, basis in Nova Scotia hospitals. That's uh, involuntary, so that's voluntary and involuntary. Oh, so, and the number of involuntary admissions, including admissions for the purpose of involuntary assessment, is between 1,000 and 1,300 in any given year. So if we do the math, that's about 44% of all uh, admissions. And you have to kind of, there's a fudge factor in there because what they're saying is that when pe there's two types of involuntary, pro the, uh, like I mentioned before, there's the medical assessment, which is a 72-hour involuntary uh, assessment, and then there's uh, an involuntary admission, which can be up for thir up to 30 days. And there's also the in at the front end, there's the involuntary uh, medical examination. So what they're talking about here is. Um, people that are going for the involuntary assessment and then the involuntary hospitalizations. Um, and that can be up to 44% of, of the, the number that I first gave you, which was the number of people that are hospitalized uh, 
on an inpatient basis. So, in other words, uh, the number that I was hearing when I when this when IPTA was first proposed was, uh, you know, on a few percentage, a few percent of people will be affected by IPTA. Well, actually, in um, point of point of fact, is that it's it's up to almost 50 percent of people uh, that are involuntarily hospitalized or in some way affected by IPTA. And that may not surprise some of the family members that are here today, because I think a lot of family members um, may have some experience with involuntary psychiatric uh, hospitalization of their loved ones. Um, for those who have been hospitalized as uh, involuntary, sorry, as volunteer as patients, um, my own experience is that I've been hospitalized voluntarily three times uh, for mental illness. And those voluntary admissions were all, uh, wouldn't say enjoyable, but they certainly were uh, worthwhile and very effective in terms of my recovery. Um, what I want to focus on today is, um, I'm going to jump ahead and come back to that slide. What I want to focus on today is what, um, what is important and what came out of this uh, report in terms of recommendations that showed that families and, and people who are living with mental illness and maybe involuntarily hospitalized want more than just psychotropic medications. They want to see treatment that is uh, that goes beyond that. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about some of the other uh, treatments that are available to you know to people today psychological treatments psychosocial supports housing supports which we'll hear about uh, at the end of the meeting and uh, social supports as I mentioned that include that includes peer support and education and work supports all of those are important to, to recovery uh, from mental illness uh, I know from my experience but but I'm but what's pointed out and what I've learned from family members over the course of the last seven years and what's clearly pointed out in this report is that involuntary psychiatric treatment has historically been meds only and we need to move beyond that and that re this report is clearly saying that okay and so on page 23 and I'll, and I'll have to read this this is what it, what it says uh, requests from family members supported very strongly by the Nova Scotia Schizophrenia Society for more clarity on the need for consent from substitute decision makers on behalf of patients for treatments beyond psychiatric treatments, more specifically beyond pharmacological treatments. And another quote which appears on page 56, and I'll read this. The concern was that there was too much and even exclusive reliance on pharmaceutical therapy. Talk therapy, cognitive and rehabilitative therapy were three of the therapies that people wanted to see used in conjunction with pharmaceutical therapy more frequently. Their view was that these therapies not only can accentuate the benefits of medication, but strengthen the patient's capacity to function independently outside the hospital. And I, you know, I think uh, clearly these uh, quotes are quite relevant uh, in terms of the review and quite relevant in terms of some of the recommendations that I want to talk about next. So one of the recommendations, the, the 21st one, and this has to do with recommendations on overall functioning of the act relative to patient well-being. And, and, I'll, and I'll read this to you. Effort should be made to ensure the language in the act is not constraining or interpreted to constrain the range of mental health care services available to IPTA patients to the extent necessary to prevent the language of IPTA from having this effect appropriate amendments to IPTA should be made. So, and my experience working with families and working with people who live with mental illness 
has been that the act uh, doesn't address, as I mentioned, doesn't address going beyond just the medications. In fact, uh, there's a quote in the act, and I'll read it to you, uh, with regard to how the act seems to be working now. The functioning of IPTA relative to patient well-being ultimately depends on the contributions that the treatment provided under the act make to patient well-being. The psychiatric therapy provided under IPTA consists largely, largely of, an, of the injection of psychotropic medications. And that's a quote from page Roman numeral 15. There's deep disagreement among, among experts on mental health legislation about the contribution this kind of treatment makes to the well-being of patients. In other words, just using injectable antipsychotics as a way of getting people better, it's, it's a, it's, it can be a cornerstone, it can be a, a key component of recovery, but it's not the only thing that, that, that's required in order for, for people to get better. But what we're seeing and what we've seen over the, over the past seven years is that's what's happened, okay? And this review is saying we need to change that. So the next recommendation, which is related again to patient well-being and related to what I'm, what I'm talking about, is district health authorities and the mental health care system more generally should commit to making comprehensive discharge planning available to all IFTA patients with appropriate involvement of family members and community supports. Now, I've worked with family members where when they don't even get invited to team meetings if they're, if they're substitute decision makers and they have to ask to go and uh, it, it's really quite frustrating to in, in some instances to to be in, to be involved and to see this happening but this recommendation is saying let's not have this happen anymore another recommendation and by the way, I don't have a, lo a whole lot of slides, so you can rest <laughs> easy. <laughs> I'm not going to be here all night doing this. <laughs> um, and this is a, a recommendation on the interpretation of the Act. And it, it reads as follows. Consideration should be given to whether the Act should better reflect the roles played by physicians who are not psychiatrists and other kinds of mental health care professionals relative to responsibilities that are currently defined as exclusively the role of psychiatrists. So the if that is written really refers, if you read it, you'll read a lot about what psychiatrists may or may not do, but it doesn't say much about what other health care professionals can do. And so what, what this recommendation is saying is let's change that, okay? So, that, so let's, let's change that. And with regard to the functioning of uh, IFTA under Section 59, which refers to community treatment orders, there's a recommendation in this, in this report that says the legislative framework for the provision of psychiatric treatment in the community on a voluntary basis. Uh, so what they want, so what they're saying here is they want a legislative framework for the provision of psychiatric treatment in the community on a voluntary basis that is symmetrical with and proportionate to the framework that IFTA currently creates for voluntary treatment in hospitals. And that should be added to IFTA. That's a little bit confusing, but what it's saying is IFTA refers to voluntary treatment in the hospital as it does to involuntary treatment. IFTA refers to involuntary treatment in, in the community. It's called a community treatment order. Why doesn't IFTA also refer to voluntary treatment in the community? Okay, that's, you, if you think about what I'm saying, Can I'm, say that? yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. What I'm saying is they're saying there should be a radical shift in the way treatment is provided to both voluntary and involuntary patients in the community, particularly to voluntary patients. That's what they're saying in this recommendation, okay? They're saying that voluntary patients in the community um, 
treatment of voluntary patients in the community should be embedded in IFTA. Just like treatment of voluntary inpatient inpatients is embedded in, in IFTA. Okay? So what it's saying is put it put into law how patients who are voluntary should be treated in the community. Okay, so so it's a little bit confusing, but it's it's saying it's saying quite radically that our government should legislate mental health treatment overall. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get to that point because they have a recommendation where they quite uh, straightforwardly and very succinctly will stipulate that. And that's recommendation number eight. And I'm going to get to that recommendation. You need to look at the dog again. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I want to talk now about substitute decision makers, okay? Some of you I know have been substitute decision makers, and I've worked with many people who have been substitute decision makers. And this next slide gets to a lot of the problems that I've seen. And it uh, has a lot of words on it, but these words are very, very important um, about substitute decision makers. So it says, measures should be taken by the district health authorities to ensure that substitute decision makers, number one, have ready access to the information they need to carry out their roles on behalf of patients, including information about the act and its operation. So that's number one. Why are they putting that in there? Because people said, we're not getting that information, right? So they're making a recommendation, give, them, give substitute decision makers that information. And number two, that substitute decision makers are kept informed about the treatment and progress of the patient, including during the discharge planning stage of treatment. I mean, it's a duh, you know, but it's because it doesn't happen, right? That's why this is in there. Unfortunately, it doesn't happen. I, like I said, I've been to meetings, and I've, I'm an emo I can be emotional <laughs> like I am right now, but I've been to meetings where I've actually had to walk out because nothing's happening, and things are happening that I just can't believe, right? And so having seen these recommendations is like, to me, it's like, wow, finally, people are recognizing what needs to change, right? And number three, substitute decision makers are provided opportunity to participate in decision making relating to the full range of treatment options for the patient, including discharge planning. So when we talk about discharge planning, it doesn't mean that, you know, make sure you got your prescription filled, <laughs> right? It means, does, does the person have appropriate housing to go to? You know, does the person have appropriate follow-up in the community, right? You know, is the person going to be on a community treatment order or not? Are they going to be on a leave certificate or not? Are they, if they're voluntary, are they going to have services which follow them in, in the community, right? And so you can see where I'm getting where this volunteer, having services in the community for voluntary patients and embedded in this act is important because otherwise it won't happen. Yes. Do med schools not train their doctors to consult outside their own powers? It seems that's the way things are run. Psychiatrist doesn't want any interference in his decision. Uh, well, I, I, well, I would agree with you in, in that regard. Why that is, I think there are newer, younger psychiatrists who tend to be more. Um, more engaging in terms of working with other professionals who can provide assistance to people who uh, have uh, a mental illness, right? So the younger psychiatrists I see are more willing to engage in, in further exploration of what can help a person recovery, uh, in their recovery. Yeah. Yeah? Do, we, do we need to consider the difference between a legal decision maker and a care provider such as a parent or a child who's caring for that person? 
a legal decision maker would 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 have would be a substitute decision maker under IPTA if the person was involuntarily hospitalized as an inpatient or if they're on a CTO, right? Now that person who's the substitute decision maker may not be a family member because as a, pa a patient can make a decision when they have uh, full capacity to name their substitute decision maker uh, under a certain law, it's called the Personal Health Information Act, right? So a person can make a living will and they can name their substitute decision maker should, should they become involuntarily hospitalized. And that may not be a family member. Um, so if the, under the act, if the person is involuntarily hospitalized or on a CTO, the family can actually be, if the substitute decision maker is not a family member, the family can be somewhat shut out of that, okay? That's just the way that the law works. What I would say to a family member would be, um, you know, do your best that you can to support your loved one under the circumstances. That, that's the best that you can do. And hopefully um, they will reconnect with you as, as a family member if that's the situation, right? Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about under recommendation number eight, um, and we all maybe, well, I don't want to get into privacy right yet, um, but I think recommendation number eight is getting at the fact that people with mental illness who are on their roads to recovery need more than just their injection every two weeks or every 30 days, right? Um, they need more supports in the community. And people who live with mental illness are asking for that. Okay? Yeah. Would you look at recommendation 29 and 30, please? Do you have them? I do have them. Okay. It's about substitute decision making. Okay. Um, can you just hold on a sec sure. until I see where I'm at and then and then we'll, so, so I'm going to move on to the next slide and see where I'm at. I'm still with substitute decision makers, so I'll I'll finish with that and then I'll get to get to your your question. So just to follow up on substitute decision makers and um, what IPTA should be doing, IPTA should be amended to make clear that substitute decision makers are to be involved in all decision making relating to the patient. That would be within the scope of the patient's right to exercise informed consent if the patient was a capable patient. You have to remember that lawyers wrote all these recommendations. So. <laughs> um, but, but this gets to actually one of the points that I raised with the reviewers was that the IPTA was not clear on this. And they write in, in the smaller print, which in their recommendation is the same size, but I won't read the smaller print. But what this basically means is that substitute decision makers are making decisions on treatment and care of an individual who, if they had the capacity to make those decisions, would be making them themselves. Okay? And so if I have been voluntarily hospitalized and I'm, I'm making decisions all on my own, about my care. And I say, what about this? What about that? Why aren't I getting this? You know, I mean, I want CBT. I got CBT. I want this. What, you know, and so substitute decision makers, they're saying here that substitute decision makers have that same right. Right? And so I'm pointing that out to you. Um, I believe that under the act as it's, as, it, as it's now written, substitute decision makers have that right. Okay? I, a lot of parents don't, <laughs> don't feel that they have that right. It's unfortunate because if the, I think it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take this being hit over a few people's heads before they realize that if the says a few things that they don't realize it says, even without this review, right?
I mean, I've been back, I've been trying to say this for years, right? And finally, people are starting to get it. But it's but it's it's taken this, and thank goodness for this review, so that people can realize that changes have to be made, right? So with regard to treatment, I ask myself, when I'm a voluntary patient and I'm thinking about asking for a certain treatment, do I have a right to insist on this, right? Um, so we, as a substitute decision maker, you have to ask yourself when you're thinking about, I want to go to, the, to my son or daughter's treating psychiatrist and ask them or insist on that my son or daughter gets cognitive and behavioral therapy, okay? I was lucky enough as a, uh, I, wasn't an invo I wasn't an inpatient at the time I asked for, well, it, it was suggested to me actually that I get CBT and I quickly agreed to it. I didn't have to, but I agreed to it, right? CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy, which was very, very beneficial to my recovery. Recently, there was a paper came out in Lancet with weak that CBT can be very effective, effective for treatment of schizophrenia for people that aren't on medication, right? And that is, and Lancet is one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world. Okay, and you might want to just check out that publication. I'm not, and I'm not advocating at all that people should go off their medication. What I'm saying is that there are other ways that people can progress in in their recoveries. For me, it's a combination of medication and psychological uh, help and social psychosocial help, um, supported employment. That kind of thing, right? So, so this this particular slide says, no, you don't have a right to insist on a particular treatment. However, uh, you do have a right to receive adequate care. Uh, and you, the doctor, and if you're a substitute decision maker, the doctor should explain why the treatment that you want is not is not available or not or not available, not prescribed. Here it says prescribed, but prescribed can be, you can prescribe. My doctor, I, I had a uh, problem with my neck, and my doctor prescribed uh, massage therapy and put it on a little prescription pad, right? Massage therapy and um, chiro chiropractic therapy if I want and then something else, right, and, and physiotherapy. So prescribe those three things. Those aren't medication, right? So the word prescribed doesn't necessarily mean medication. It could mean any, any kind of helpful intervention. Um, now, if the doctor considers that the treatment might be harmful to you or inappropriate in the circumstances, he, he, the doctor can say no or it may not be readily available, so, but it doesn't hurt to, what I, my point is it doesn't hurt to ask, okay? It doesn't hurt to ask. So, and if you think the doctor should prescribe the treatment, uh, and that, so, so if you think that the doctor should prescribe the treatment and that you may suffer injury because of the refusal, you should ask for a second opinion, okay? In other words, this is saying that if you think that your doctor should prescribe something and, it, and your doctor doesn't, you should ask for a second opinion. So, and that's not, and as I was looking at this and thinking about this and coming about coming tonight and saying this, it's like, who's going to get a second opinion in psychiatry, right? It's like, it's like, I mean, I've had people, I, I've recommended to people get a second opinion, right? Um, get a second opinion. And, and then if you do, MSI wants to know why there's two billings for the same question. Right. So there's a lot of problems with that. And the same, you know, two week period. And and the other thing you might want to consider is changing doctors. It's not so easy to do when it, when it's a psychiatric illness. <laughs> and so and the type of treatment you receive will also depend upon available resources and facilities. And in mental health, we all know that that's 
probably the limit, the rate limiting factor in getting well, right? Mm -hmm. Is having these available resources and facilities, and that needs to change. That needs to change, and it, people like you that ha have to help change that, right? You need, you've got to get your voice out there. But thank goodness for this, because that's this is a big start. The Hyde inquiry in that report was a, was another was another <clears throat> was another kind of movement forward in getting things to change, right? It's, it's unfortunate that things. Well, this didn't have, there wasn't a, a tragedy that brought this, this was legislated review after five years. So the Howard Hyde was a tragedy. We had a tragedy a couple weeks ago, okay, in, in Halifax. A fellow died by suicide because of, well, I'm not going to speculate, but, but there could have, things may have been done differently. Mobile crisis may have been the first responders, in my opinion. But they weren't. They weren't even on scene, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and there's going to be a in, there's going to be a investigation as to what happened, and it's going to be made publicly available. So things are changing, and tragedies usually are what's happening to make things change. But this is not one of those tragedies. And this gives us an opportunity to make some change without having to have a tragedy. So I'm going to go to Bev with her question about uh, recommendation 29 and 30. 29 and 30. Look at the time. Okay, They're both kind of together. So I'm looking at 29 and I see a lot of words. <laughs> <laughs> Read quickly. And I'm looking oh. at 30 and I'm seeing, okay, so 29, can you just paraphrase it for me? It's about the substitute decision maker and whether they follow prior capable informed con expressed wishes or not. Right. Uh, and my understanding reading the two of them is that uh, it can go, the review board can have the jurisdiction over whether the substitute decision maker uh, is making the right decisions if they go against the prior capable informed expressed wishes. This is something we may have to talk about Another after. Okay. Yeah. Um, only because uh, for me to make a uh, having you know just it's going to take me some time to contemplate this and see what it means and get back to you with a more informed answer i think would be would be more appropriate under the circumstances yeah so Steve, yeah yeah sorry but, but just you know i know you don't have an opportunity to look at that recommendation in detail but just from what bev said it seems like what it's, it's saying is that the substitute decision maker can't walk into that environment uninformed as to what the wishes of the patient are and start making decisions. That if, if you know, and it may be that if you know that you're a substitute decision maker, you should make sure that you have a conversation with the person when they're in a position to make informed decisions so that you're aware of what their wishes are and you can then maybe not demonstrate but at least be able to explain to the people you're dealing with that you have had that conversation with the patient. And I, I would think that would be of assistance in making, to exercising your rights as a, 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 an alternate decision maker. I have concerns about it, like recommendation 77, IPTA should be amended to expressly authorize the review board to review the consistency of the decision of substitute decision maker with the criteria for substitute decision making set out in the act. I just don't know that we'd ever get to the point of um, 
having expressed wishes of our family member mm -hmm. being good decisions. Right. Yeah. And therefore the review board could take this vote of my plan if yeah. that ever happened, and yeah. it might never. Yeah. Uh, and you know, basically make their own decisions which might would not be in his best That's what I come from. So I, I don't have that confidence in the review board for making this decision. Mm. Well, it, you know, it's, it says, should be, in the number 29 says, uh, talks about uh, replaced with a provision that gives greater protection and weight to the prior capable and informed expressed wishes of the patient. So let's think about that, and that's what the crux, I think, of your question here, is that you're believing that perhaps, uh, in your case, the expressed, the prior capable informed expressed wishes of the patient may not have a lot to do or may be motivated by illness. So in other words, they're not capable. I would argue they're not they're not capable of informed expressed wishes. Mm -hmm. So you would have to prove to the review board that those that those prior what you have in front of you to work with are not capable informed expressed wishes of the patient. I guess in cap being capable is so that the be operative word. Ca right. Being capable yeah. is the operative. So you would have to prove to the review board that that those that those expressed wishes were not provided mm -hmm. when the patient was capable. That's good. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you can be incapable and be incapable. Sorry? You can be incapable of making treatment decisions while you're in a contagion? Under a yeah, CTO, so definitely. Not under a CTO? So, under the Hospitals Act, you can. Like, you can be voluntary and not capable. But they're looking at that too, and the review board can look at whether that is. That under a legal. CTO, you have to be incapable. And you're basically in the community. You, you, you lack capacity to make your own treatment decisions. That's that's part of the definition of being on a CTO. But if you're not on a CTO, it, it, this whole act also addressed the fact that some people were involuntary, made voluntary, uh, and made incapable of making treatment decisions. But the time lapse before they get out into the community means that they cannot go on a CTO. So they're right. They're incapable making treatment decisions, but they are voluntary while they're in the hospital. They're not under the hospital's act, yeah. Yes, but when they leave the hospital. I think there are a lot of people in the community, not on the CTO, mm -hmm. that are incapable of making good treatment decisions. They don't have a mm -hmm. substitute decision making. They may not have Some any formal arrangement. We have a lot of folks at my work that we are already substitute decision makers, and a lot of folks that I work with sometimes aren't capable of making decisions even while they're on commute, in the community before whether it's involuntary or voluntary even happens. But at that time, many of the decisions that they're making, they're incapable of making decisions that better their wellness. Yeah. Yeah. It's just tough to differentiate between the two sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so I... When I thought about what I was going to present tonight, <laughs> I thought I could present a whole bunch. Of, I mean, so that could be another presentation. Oh, sure. Yeah. It would take, you know, because that required a lot of thought on the on the presenter. Mm -hmm. Certainly, then you know, there's a lot of issues there too, and so that could be another topic for another night. But thanks for bringing that up. It is it is important. Um, yeah. So, because I am, I got about ten minutes left. Yeah. And I don't have many slides left. <laughs>
Um, well, this has to do with community treatment orders and the functioning of IPTA. Um, so, uh, this is really uh, a restatement of what, many of the concerns that people had with CTOs and trying to resolve that, which is the mental health care sh system should undertake a systematic e effort working in collaboration with partners in the broader mental health system to address the barriers that prevent community services and resources being available to persons under a CTO. I mean, that was one of the arguments that people had why CTO shouldn't be instated because the services aren't out there. So they're just saying, well, let's make the services available, right? So I just wanted to point that out. It's there. And it's kind of a lead in, it fits the theme of what I'm talking about today. And so, and it leads into my final few slides. And really the take home message that I want to make. And that is in recommendation number eight, if you read the bottom line, they're, they're suggesting that there should be a new law established in Nova Scotia. And that law would be called the Mental Health and Addictions Care Planning Act. Okay? And so I'll just read, read this. The, the consideration should be given to the development and adoption of legislation that complements IPTA and the Health Authorities Act by providing a statutory framework for development and implementation of, of I think there's a word in there, of Nova Scotia's mental health strategy as amended from time to time, building on the release of Nova Scotia's first mental health strategy in 2012. So everybody might know about the strategy. I won't go into it, but it does exist. And they have put some money into it. Put Topic money. for another night. Yeah, putting <laughs> money into peer support. So they're saying such legislation should be called the Mental Health and Addictions Care Planning Act. So, and, and, uh, oops. and so what does that mean? So this act could, they say could, set the goals of the mental health system or authorize the setting of these goals. So legislate that. Define the mental health system of Nova Scotia to include health, community services, education, and justice systems to the extent that each has a role to play in mental health. So that, I mean, this is legislating that. And that's pretty important legislation to have in place. Because you're legislating, yeah, you're legislating, so you're we're saying for health and community services to work together, and if you, <laughs> and it's legislated that you do, right? So when this comes to um, law amendments and housing in there too, it's, you know, it's no good to be institutionalized everybody if they're on the street. Yeah, well, housing would be included um, it's, it's, it's under community services. Community services. Yeah. We're still looking for. You know, and let me just say, that. Amy, that this report just suggests yeah. that, that this act, <laughs> yeah. the government might be going, even though uh, Minister uh, Devine. Diving. Glavine. V L E I N. Oh, it's. Glavine? Glavine. 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 Okay, Glavine. I want to say, I want to say Glavine. Oh, it's a, it starts with a, that's right, it starts with a G. <laughs> Glavine. Yeah. Thank you. Even though he said, you know, that they're looking at and want to support what's in, what's in these recommendations. Um, there's no guarantee that this is going to happen, right? Um, it's up to people like us to, you know, lobby. talk to our uh, MLAs and lobby for it. So the next, okay, so I'm on number C. Create a framework for collaboration and coordinated effort on mental health by the ministers of health, community services, education, and justice, their departments, and the systems within their respective jurisdictions. So that's kind of a further definition of B. So. Mm -hmm. 
and two more slides. And make the same ministers and their departments collectively responsible for the ongoing development of the province's mental health strategy and individually responsible within appropriate and necessary collaboration for implementation of the strategy within their respective spheres of responsibility in accordance with re relevant legislation, such as the Health Authorities Act in the case of the healthcare system. So these are, this is pretty, this is going quite a, quite a ways in terms of um, making a huge suggestion for change, right? And it all ties into the topic of what I brought here tonight about how things could change for the better. And finally, outline a framework for evidence-based decision-making and continuing public participation in the process of developing the province's mental health strategy. So continue on with that process, right? Which was a great process. And finally, require evaluation and public reporting on the results of evaluation on the implementation of the mental health strategy and progress towards the goals set out in the legislation and the strategies in, in the legislation they're proposing. So, that's it for tonight. Um, I'm certainly open for discussion and questions. Uh, it's a lot to digest in one night, I know, but and there's a lot more, and I'm, you know, to to look at in terms of the 101 recommendations. Um, Steve, I do. What's the easiest way to get your hands on the full document? Well. We, you can get it online, but you'd have to print it off yep. uh, yourself. Yep, right. not a problem. Yeah, so the actual uh, review itself is 172 pages. Yep. And then the rest is appendices. Right, and which website do you go to to download that document? The Department of Health website. Okay. Yeah, go to the Department of Health and Mental Health Services and look on the upper right hand corner of that okay. page and there's a link. All right, thanks. And I can send it out uh, to you. The I can link? Give you the link. Yeah, that'd yeah. be great. Maybe you can post the link on the SSNS site. Website. Yeah, that'd be great. Does, is there a certain thing as there used to be you know, government bookstore in quotation marks that you know, would sell, sell you, you know, I'm sure, if, yeah. I'm just, and things like I don't know. If it's well, I asked like anymore. when this came out, I I asked uh, for a copy. Yeah, and, and by email, I knew who to ask. Right. Well, not that I know who to ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just worked out that way. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean the Schizophrenia luck. Society was asked to to comment on on the release of the report and we were included in the in the press release, right? And so I was connected to somebody who had access to the report. Yeah. Steve, now after you've gone through that and, and we've had a sample of some of the recommendations, could you just review or repeat again the minister's reaction to that document? Yeah. And I do want to talk about the review board because that's one slide I glossed over at the beginning. For those who, uh, and since you brought it up, Beth, I do want to talk about the review board. So that's prepared all What did he actually say about it? Because there's some really strong need in this, right? Yeah. So I, I actually, that's, I did, yeah, in my mind, I went, what did he actually say about that? It, we'll consider. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I do want to talk about the one. When this came, report came out, there was a reporter with Canadian Press 
who was in contact with me and he said, you know, the report's coming out today, you know, would you read it, blah, 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 have comments on it, and I, so I, yeah, I said, okay. So I had like about an hour to, to look at the report. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he comes back and he says, so I had my talking points and I wanted to talk about certain things, and he said, no, no, no I want to talk about what they said about the review board. And this is, okay. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we're gonna have that for a little excitement. Um, this is what, on page 70 of this document, it says about review board. There is nothing that gives us more concern about the functioning of the act relative to its current objectives than the current functioning of the review board. Wow. Okay. And there's 17 recommendations in here about the review board. Wow. So, Bev, you think, you, I mean, it's almost like, to me, it's like, yeah, I'd be concerned about the review board because, but, I was a member of the review board, and when I was introduced, you heard the term Psychiatric Facilities Review Board. I was a member 2005, 2007. That was before the new act came out. And I was actually involved in developing the policy manual for the new review board. But then I was gone by, even before the act was put into effect. Um, th but I was working with people on the review board and the chair at that time, you know, to develop the policy manual for the review board. But what has obviously happened, and I knew at that time that the review board itself was not well supported with money, right? Um, there was one administ part-time assistant in the Department of Health that would do certain things, and they weren't, you know. But what this report is saying is that, and I, and I knew that this was happening, because I was, as the review was going on, I was asking the review board for, for their reports to, uh, they're supposed to report to the uh, legislature every year and they weren't and things were, you know, data was all blah, you know, so <laughs> it's like, and then so, and this report is saying that, and my comment is not against the review board. I know that, I mean, if it's the same person that I worked with and if she's still there, I know she's good. They're just, they're not given the support by the Department of Health. And so when I, the reporter called me and said, I want you to talk about this, I said, and it's in the paper where it was, you know, I said, thank goodness they did this review, right? And it came up with, you know, and came up with those points, right? Um, so 17 recommendations about the review board, and it's more all in line with, you know, administration and process, right? Get things right, get their data collecting right, help them do their job, right? They're good people, help them do their job. And this is what they need to be doing. Uh, but, so that doesn't get necessary to your point, which is more, Bev, um, how do I make sure that as an SDM, subject decision maker, if I am challenged on my decisions by my loved one, and he, he you or can she. You be challenged by the review board. Well, but so, you can be challenged by the review board, yeah. How would, I, how, would I, how would I prepare myself, yeah, for that? Yeah. So that is something that, that is the topic for another night. I'd love to come back and talk about it. Um, although I don't like doing talks like this where I have to read. So much information. Let's look at the dog one more time. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. Oh, we have questions online. We have one question just right now from Jeff, who's asking, is saying, I have been advocating for years that the word treatment should have a legal definition that clearly identifies the scope of the term as it applies to the act. This would be ideal for including the input of the patient's own psychiatrist, GP, and support people. It should also include treatments other than medications. It could also include recreational activities that might assist recovery. Exactly. I, I agree with you, Jeff, 100%. And uh, one of those recommendations was getting to that. Uh, it was, I'll just refer you to it. 
just so it's one where it had the little print underneath. Recommendation 76. Um, yeah, the small print says, in this regard, and to address consistency, an amendment should be considered in relation to clause 2Z, which re refers to care or treatment decisions, clause, uh, section 39, which refers to specified psychiatric treatment and other related medical treatment, and section 38, which re references consent. But yeah, I, I agree with you, and it, I've worked with the same problems, and, you know, and I, and I get back to what I said very early on is, it seems that, and I, I read the quote from the report, the psychiatric therapy provided under IPTA consists largely of, largely of the injection of psychotropic medication. And that was my whole point of the talk today. Yeah, not <laughs> We don't want that anymore. I mean, let's move on from that. And so, Jeff, I'm 100% behind you on that. Thank you for your question, by the way. We have one more question. Um, how realistic is it that professionals will move away from psychotropic drugs and look for more alternatives to treatment? Based on the article in Lancet that came out last <laughs> week, that, you know, I think what I'm hopeful uh, that there's there's certainly a strong push from from patients to move in that direction because of the side effects of the medications. Right? Mm -hmm. Some of them have very severe side effects. Um, some of the medication, and I'm not saying no, I'm not suggesting at all that anybody should stop taking medication that's helping them. Uh, but I think that uh, there are other alternatives that aren't given a fair enough chance right now. And uh, whether it's because they're just not uh, supported, I, my own feeling is some of them are very well uh, based in evidence, and, uh, but they're just not funded. And right. not available. Yeah. And not available. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. a good example is why isn't psychiatric? Sorry, psychological. Why aren't psychological services right. funded by MSI? Right. That's I mean, yeah. because yeah. they could, you know, I, they could fill that gap. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think many of them anyway. Mm -hmm. Many of the gaps. And also in terms of professionals, going back to what this gentleman was saying about um, the profession, the medical professionals having contact with people outside that sphere. Um, I know social workers do a whole lot more than what some professionals think they do, um, outside of just kind of interviewing and intakes and that type of thing. Like, there's some skill there that I think is untapped in yeah. society, yeah. Um, and in that medical, which would be great, great help. Oh yeah, yeah, and, uh, and things are changing in capital health slowly. Mm -hmm. Um, with some with these new hubs, I hear uh, there's some good things going on there in terms of you know some some work um, that involves other disciplines besides psychiatry. Um, so, you know it's taken a, a while. I mean I've been doing this kind of work for quite a while, <laughs> 15 years I guess, and you know things have changed quite a bit since I first started 15 years ago. You know so. Hopefully, you know, this is our, our opportunity with this, you know, and, so, and recommendation eight in this, you know, to start asking for, you know, our government to, to take these things seriously. Right? Stephen, is there a minister that's uh, championing that change in legislation? Or is there an obvious minister we should be lobbying who can champion that change? Because it's going to take political will to have some of that stuff enacted, yes? Yeah. Minister uh, Levine, what is he minister of, Stephen? Health. Is health he health? wellness, yeah. So is he the guy? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would go two prongs. Health and community services, because what happened is the past few governments downloaded a lot of stuff that was used to be health 
all the community yeah. services. And they really and need so, to work together anyway. And one. so, yeah, Joanne Bernard is the community mm -hmm. services minister, mm -hmm. and she's somebody who has yeah. 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 some lived experience and different mm -hmm. stuff going on. Yeah. So maybe yeah. actually yeah. all four groups should be brought in. You're talking not just health, community services, you're talking education, mm -hmm. and the biggest thing is justice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, as you mentioned about that, Mr. Pye, uh, look what happened there because the RCMP and security people had no idea how to handle that particular situation because they didn't know. Education is going to be a big factor here. It's going to be a big factor for the city police, the RCMP. Yeah. Ground I search, even ground search and rescue people, it's a big factor. Yeah, yeah. All groups I, agree, I agree all of those people need to be involved in order to move how we deal with mental mm -hmm. health issues forward. But I was just thinking in terms of this very narrow bringing about new legislation, it's going to take somebody who's going to bring it to the forefront of the legislature and get it voted on, right? So yeah. somebody's going to have to be the race. champion. In I would there. say go after all of them. Go after the send letters yeah. to Stephen McNeil. You're going to yeah. have to go after them. We've been trying to deal with MLAs and things for years, and I'll tell you that's one thing. You got to go after more than one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. My experience with the new minister, Glavine, I finally say his name, <laughs> <laughs> um, has not been good so far. Maybe you could say his name right. In terms of accessibility? <laughs> right. Yeah. Inaccessible. Inaccessible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately. So We've asked for meetings and Nothing finally so we funny. finally got a response after two months and said, well, you can meet with my yeah. senior yeah. staff. Yeah. And he says he, he wants to meet with community groups on that one slot, or he wants to meet with people. Well, Not make it. Them. I mean, I don't mean to be negative, but yeah. you know, I'm just little, early warning signs. Early are warning out. signs are out there, right? If he, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Maureen McDonald would, you know, well, took a few months, or maybe it was a year. A little over a year. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> over, yeah. We've yeah. got just uh, one comment and one question more. Do we okay. have time for that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, then, recommendation eighty. Why? Would be easily resolved if they let me know that service was needed in Cumberland County. I have been called to visit the Amherst Hospital. No problem for me to look after that need. Yeah, there is one recommendation which I didn't mention about. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, to ensure the avail availability of patient advisory services to patients on um, community treatment orders who live in Cumberland District. So Jeff is going to take care of that. So. He said. Uh, if they let me know the service was needed in Cumberland County, uh, no problem for him to look after that need. He's been called to visit the Amherst Hospital. So he, he will be looking after that? I that's He's suggesting that he can, yeah. Okay. And then he had a question, what is there to prevent a psychiatrist switching from IPTA to the Hospitals Act and keep the patient involuntary without the full protection of IPTA as regard to reviews? Not to run that by me again. What is it to prevent a psychiatrist switching from IPTA to the Hospitals Act mm -hmm. and keep the patient involuntary without the full protection of IPTA as regards reviews? In order to do that, um, he would make the patient voluntary mm -hmm. and incapable. Uh, that's my understanding. Because mm -hmm. in order to be only under the uh, under the Hospitals Act, you have to be incapable. Um, and to not be under IPTA, uh, you have to be a voluntary patient. Correct? So correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, by chatting or sending in a comment. But, and I think that they're talking about that particular issue in this report, and I didn't go into great detail myself about that to try to learn about it. Um, and I think that in this report they're saying that that's a problem that they can make a patient who's incapable voluntary and get them out of IPTA and therefore they, there's no reviews and they identify that problem in this report in my quick you know going through other recommendations besides the ones I focused on tonight 
that uh, I, I'm pretty sure that they've outlined and flagged that as a problem. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, I think that we need to finish this up. Um, and uh, just two little housekeeping things. There should be an attendance sheet uh, floating around here. So if you haven't signed that, would you please sign it? And there should be some more evaluation forms uh, around there if you haven't received them. Do that, okay? And now we have uh, Lyndon to uh, talk about some housing initiatives and a meeting that's going to be held. Right. Thanks. Uh, I'll trade places yeah. with you, Stephen. Uh, we're still online, I think. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'll just turn this on. Right. Hi, everybody. Hello. My name's uh, Lyndon Gray. I'm met some of you before or at least seen some of you before um, maybe some of you as recently as at the um, schizophrenia society conference um, where uh, there was a session uh, presented by a group of people from montreal um, part of an organization called la brillantville which is a supported housing model that's been operating in Montreal for about 20 years. And if you want to know more about that, you can go on. It's online. It's L apostrophe. I think the actual web address is L A B R I E N B I L L E dot org, I think maybe, but you'll have to try C A and COM and I don't know, one of those endings. Uh, and you'll find out more about that organization. Um, it just struck me about a year ago that um, my husband and I were not going to be able to provide sufficient support for our son uh, over his lifetime, that at some point we would either become infirm or dead. In either case, we wouldn't be able to continue the level of support. And, and as it was, the level of support we were providing him was inadequate, much as we were dancing as fast as we could. We couldn't be everything and provide everything and connect him in every way that he needed. And um, looking around and finding myself lost in a spider web of organizations, um, some profit, some not for profit, some governmental, many of which are still out there and I'm unaware of them despite considering myself pretty good at research. I still haven't uncovered everything that's out there. and. Um, Instead of sitting around feeling sorry for him and sorry for us and mad at the world, I decided maybe I needed to be the change I wanted to see and that if there was going to be supportive housing in the community for people, I had to be part of the answer. So um, I started trying to figure out what models already existed so I wasn't reinventing the wheel and just by a wonderful set of coincidences, um, my husband connected me to a very old friend of his, whose wife was um, a board member of Le Brionville in Montreal, and I went there last summer to visit. So the long and the short of it is that I have a framework for a model that we'll be bringing to Halifax. We hope to open our first apartment in the summer, um, and we hope it's one of dozens and hopefully hundreds over the next few years that open up in Nova Scotia. Um, the basic idea of the model is that people can be well and people can fulfill their potential if they have access to uh, ready support and a very wide variety of support. That the government can't afford to provide it all, it can't all be paid, you can't pay people to love other people. And people with mental health issues often are hard to love but need loving more than the average person does. So the idea behind the model is um, to, uh, to establish an organization that will rent from sympathetic landlords three bedroom and one bedroom units at a reasonable rent so that income assistance is adequate to cover that need. Um, people sharing in a three-bedroom unit are, in essence, bringing about peer support for each other right at the get-go. Um, but also that 
that threesome, that set of roommates in an apartment would have the support of a social worker, a paid employee, and the support of a large team of volunteers, not only from the general community, but from the universities and colleges that surround us, at least in the HRM and in other locations around Nova Scotia. Um, and that these individuals who volunteer from the general community will not only provide connection to the community, um, not only provide companionship, but will also um, help them to access hobbies, recreation, um, and other supportive organizations around uh, the community that they may have difficulty getting to or identifying or feeling comfortable going to on their own. Um, we've come quite a long way down the road. I have to say that um, Ministry of Community and Social Services is very supportive. The Ministry of Health is very supportive. The Ministry of Health is committed to providing a social worker um, to act as a coordinator for um, the apartment that we set up this summer and presumably additional apartments that open up over time. Um, the communities and colleges have been excited at the prospect of placing students who are in a community learning course that's part of the Department of Social Work, part of the Department of Occupational Therapy, part of the Department of Psychology and Psychiatry. Um, they're very supportive and they just say, let us know as soon as you've got the first set of residents and we'll hook you up with students who, who will come on a routine basis. What I'm hoping is that students will um, be so excited about um, the work that they do and the, and the connections they make with other people, the friendships that they form, that they'll tell friends who are not necessarily part of those departments, who might be studying history or Russian or philosophy, and that those students will also want to get involved. Um, we are having our first um, uh, planning meeting on um, March the 20th, which is a Thursday in the evening. It'll take place from 6.30 to 8.30 at the Halifax Regional Municipalities Memorial Library, the north um, branch of the library on Godigan Street. And uh, there's a little meeting room there in the library. And so it is open to anyone who is interested. So if you want to learn more about the model and if you want input into the kinds of considerations that still need to be undertaken. Um, if you want to be involved as a volunteer, either on the board or taking on some role within the board, so perhaps you're really interested in liaising with universities, or you're really interested in liaising with landlords, or you're really interested in liaising with, say, faith communities whose <coughs> congregants might be interested in becoming volunteers. Um, we're happy to have you there. If you don't have time, if time is not a thing you have to give, but you just want to be informed and you want a voice, feel free to come to the meeting. You don't actually have to commit to giving time. You just need to be there. Um, you might just want to sign up to be kept informed. You know, you might just want to leave us with your email address and say, let us know how you're doing as you go along. Um, it's going to take many hands, but I think the potential for this model is huge because I think what it does for the first time is it connects government services, paid professionals like psychiatrists and occupational therapists, um, people with mental health issues that they're struggling to overcome or have overcome but are looking for better ways to house themselves and connect to the community and the community at large. There's an awful lot of people out in the community who step over people sitting on street corners and think, I wish there was something I could do that's meaningful and productive and just don't know how. And I think this will offer those opportunities to people. Um, and I think what it does is recognize the contribution that people who struggle with mental illness could make to society if they were given the proper kinds of support. Um, I learned a lot going to Montreal about what's possible, and I think we can move even beyond the possibilities that have been explored in Montreal. It just takes <coughs> we have an awful lot of people with goodwill in this community, but they're isolated. Parents of kids with mental illness are isolated. People with mental illness are isolated. Professionals struggling alone 
with people who are recovering from mental illness or isolated. And um, I think this model will help to bring those those groups together. Um, I would really welcome your help. So if you can make the time and you just want to come and listen and talk, we'd love to have you at that meeting. The date again was Thursday, March the 20th. Um, I don't know. I'll have to talk to Terry to see if I can. Auditorium. Yeah, it's at the North Memorial, Memorial Library Auditorium. Yeah, at, yeah. beginning at 6:30 p.m. And I'm going to twist Todd's arm into um, doing a video conference of that meeting too, because I know there are communities all over Nova Scotia mm -hmm. that want to know, will take an interest in how this unfolds, and will want to try and recreate it in their own community. So we'd love to have them in on the ground floor. Mm -hmm. I'd like to yeah, ask, I'd like to ask just one question. Sure. To General, that can help. Sure. Um, can you just give an idea of what sorts of um, uh, levels of service would be provided? So, for example, my, my loved one has very profound illness and needs a, a lot of support. Right. Probably couldn't be a, a buddy or a peer within within an apartment. Right. Could you, could you address what sorts of people could qualify? Right. Um, well, the model in Montreal actually takes, takes um, intakes from a variety of referral referred sources so there might be somebody who's coming out of the shelter system who they think would would thrive in the Librionville apartment setting in my experience most of the people that they take in are at a fairly high level of wellness in terms of their so they're on their medication they've been stable on their medication for you know a period of time um, they're committed to uh, uh, reaching out, so the, the patient themselves has expressed an interest in living with others, in meeting routinely with a social worker, in um, exploring the community with others. Um, so there has to be, from the library point of view, there has to be um, the desire on the part of the individual who's recovering from the illness to participate in this housing model. Um, I, I think we're, we're going to be um, less um, restrictive in, we're calling this organization, by the way, Call de Grange is the name that we're working with, and we'll explain where that name came from at the meeting, it's a bit of a story, but um, the Call de Grange model I hope will be a little bit more experimental and a little bit more inclusive of who would benefit from the housing model. Um, the three bedroom units I think are going to require people who are looking forward to roommates. Not everybody is, not everybody feels comfortable in a shared environment. They've, they've had difficulty making it successful in the past or they're more, um, they're, they're, uh, they feel more comfortable in a more secluded living environment. And that's why we're also going to offer some one bedroom options. Um, but people who are in shared accommodation have to have a reasonable degree of wellness in order to make it work for the other two roommates. But what the model will offer is weekly meetings with the social worker, kind of like a house meeting where all three residents meet together with the social worker, talk about what's going well, talk about what they're struggling with, talk about things that they might need that they don't currently have. The social worker also meets with the um, co the uh, collective of volunteers that work in that particular apartment unit. She meets with them or he meets with them monthly to talk about coordinating everybody's efforts. Um, the kinds of things that I, I observed happening at Labrie was support for um, keeping the apartment clean and tidy and organized, support for buying groceries, support for planning menus, support for, I mean, the volunteers often would, some of them in some of the apartments, one of the volunteers um, helped one or other of the roommates make a meal for the four of them once a week. She'd go in every Thursday. Um, she'd take one of the residents in turn out to shop for the, you know, they'd plan the menu, shop for the stuff, bring it back, cook together, serve it, and she would sit and eat with them. In another apartment, one of the volunteers used to bring all three of the residents back to her family home for supper on Sunday night when all the kids were home and they'd have a great big family supper at the volunteer's home. So it kind of depended on the team of volunteers and who had interests in what and who had strengths in what. Um, 
you know, one of the guys was a, an avid bird watcher, and one of the residents was an avid became an avid bird watcher, <laughs> and the two of them would do all of these expeditions together. Um, one of them was part of a bowling team and talked one of the three residents into becoming a member of the bowling team. So, you know, the, the level of support is only limited by the imagination and the willingness of the team of volunteers that were associated with a particular apartment. Um, and I think because there is such strong will on the part of Capital Health to provide service in the community, they don't know how to do it. Like they're struggling with how to make that work. And I think this model offers an avenue of how to make that work. So I think if the social worker that Capital Health provides says this particular residence needs a higher level of service than the volunteers can provide, um, we need to provide more professional support to this individual then I think that the social worker will be able to communicate that back at Capital Health, and then there'll be some, hopefully, some means of providing that higher level of support. Just one more um, observation. I recently went through a, a program, uh, received services from a, a student at a, at a program at one of the universities by the help of my small business. And unfortunately, that wasn't very successful because um, whether their, the students didn't have a, enough maturity, enough right reason to follow through, or whatever. Right. It was, it was not, it wasn't a great match, and it kind of left me holding something uncomfortable. Right. So I, it's, you know, volunteers, right. you know, there are so many considerations to make sure they're a good match. It's, I'm sure, you know, you'll, you'll consider that. Yeah, Maybe I've that, got that, this that, manual from Labrie that's about this thick, and part of the information in there is all about proper training for volunteers. Um, and, and what I like about this model is that the social worker will be overseeing uh, and coordinating the efforts of the volunteers. So if there's a hole or a gap or something not fitting well here, it's that individual's responsibility to make the necessary changes. The beauty of students is that in this model is that they'd be part of a course. So this they, they, they would get credit for doing their uh, volunteering in the community. It's kind of like practice teachers in the in education. I'm, a, I'm an educator and I've worked as host teacher for a number of student teachers who've had their community learning course where it has to be acted out in my classroom and I evaluate how well they volunteer in my room and how much they contribute to the life of the classroom, how much they take, how well they take direction and all of that kind of thing. These students are going to be earning credit so they have the professor overseeing what they do and how they do it. They'll have the social worker overseeing, and they'll have the more mature volunteers from the community working in tandem with them. So they would work with the social worker to determine what their role will be interacting with the residents of the apartment they're assigned to. That, that sounds a bit better than relying simply on the concept of credits because my right. students also got credits for yeah. the work, the, the work yeah. that they yeah, it but needs proper supervision, it needs proper training, and without those two things, it's almost doomed to failure, right? It's like a recipe for failure, because these are, I mean, what I love about the idea of inviting students in is that often um, the average age of a volunteer in a service capacity mm -hmm. is pretty high, whereas a lot of these re residents will, will, many of them will be younger, 20s, 30s, 40s. What I'd like to see is that you know, that, that youthful exuberance and energy and, you know, well, how about we do this? Uh, you know? That, I think, combined with the more stable, mature, reliable, older volunteer, I think it's kind of magical to have both of those things well, I guess this offered is, to the residents. This must be the time to really get into these issues at this planning meeting. So yeah, exactly. That's what we're success. doing at this planning meeting. We've got it structured so that people have a lot of voice. We've got a, a set of questions. We're kind of taking a cafe model at this meeting where you'll sit with one group of people to discuss one idea and provide input and then move to another table, another group uh, within the meeting and discuss another question and provide input and feedback. And then at the very end is when we get you to sign on the dotted line. <laughs> if we can talk you into actually working with us. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, well thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, on the screen. <laughs>
that's uh, this is the end of the official part of our, our meeting for this week. I want to thank uh, Dr. Stephen Ayer and uh, for his presentation. And is it Troy or Todd? Todd. It's Todd, and I have down mm -hmm. here Troy. Okay. Mm -hmm. anyway, I get that a lot. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for your very uh, official support there. Everything seemed to go well. Uh, we're going to take just a little break now. It's about 20 to 9. Uh, actually, maybe we won't have a break. Uh, if you want to grab, uh, there's some vegetables there and so on. Uh, and then the rest of the time will just be sort of open discussion, whatever uh, people want to talk about. I want to sign off to our, our fans in cyberspace. <laughs> and uh, now um, our next uh, meeting is going to be um, the Nova Scotia Mental Health Peer Support Program with Roy Muse presenting. Uh, and Roy is a certified peer support specialist and oversees the program. So that should be very interesting as well. So 